Hi there, welcome, welcome. Come right on in. This is Homekeepers. Got a good hot cup of tea here. I hope you'll join me for the next, uh, really it's just the next few minutes and they go by so quickly, but you don't want to miss this program. I'll tell you about it in just a minute. First of all, I want to thank you uh, for tuning in. I, I just get so much joy out of reading your letters. And one thing that's so much fun is, um, if you're a regular viewer, we know you know that we say, um, email us and we'll email you the recipe. And uh, some of those have the sweetest notes with them. I just, I usually go through them first thing in the morning when I get to the office and they make my day. So thank you, thank you for taking the time. And I would imagine that one of the top, top subjects that people like to talk about and, and garner information about is money. We're gonna talk about that today. A uh, book that so surprised me when I got a hold of it, and you've got to stay tuned to hear the author because you will be surprised as well. It's called uh, God and Money and How We Discovered uh, True Riches. Uh, this was written by John Cortinas, my guest today, and Gregory Baum Baumer uh, went to Harvard Business School and um, I got the idea they went there to learn how to be rich. I would imagine most people do. They'll, he will tell you. But also, I had no idea they were so young. And you hear so much today about millennials and what they are and what they like and how they're going to vote and all this. Well, John is a, a true millennial if you've never seen one. Of course, you have seen them, but after you see him, you'll be, be able to recognize how young they are and how brilliant this book is totally based on the Word of God. So don't go away. I want you to be sure and hear what he has to say, and I want you to know what's in this book and that you would go out and buy it. Uh, before I join Stephanie, though, where we're going to make, oh, this is going to be fun, berries and cream pizza. If you've never had a fruit pizza before, um, you're missing out. So watch this, and you'll know how to make it yourself. Before I join her, though, I've got a, a book I want to offer you to support the program. It's called Food Triggers. And it's by Rhonda Epstein. She is a psychologist and has really delved into those things. You hear the word trigger a lot when it comes to drugs, alcohol, and if you recognize those, uh, you can really deal with your problems a lot better. But a lot of people, a lot of Christians uh, have problems, and uh, so this book will reveal to you the triggers that make you want to go out and eat something that you really shouldn't. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. It's based on a scripture, and it's yours for that gift of at least $15 to the program. That includes the shipping and the handling. <laughs> what, what a wonderful book full of information that could absolutely change your life. And so I hope you'll take advantage of it. The name of the book is Food Triggers, and uh, you call 1-800-229-0059. You will um, can use your credit card or your debit card or write to me at Homekeepers Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758, and we will get it out to you. And I've joined Stephanie over here. Oh, it makes you're making so noise. Pretty. I yes. know. It's delicious. So pretty. Uh, and we'll show it to you in a minute. I'm supposed to start softening up okay. this cream cheese. But you're going to show them your morning stance when you do this. Okay. I so this. cream cheese, you have... A confectionery like sugar, yes, yeah. and you have jam. jam. Okay. So you're going to mix those three up. And, and this is how Arthleen Rippy stands in the morning when yeah, she's mixing Yeah, in the things. kitchen all she the time. She goes like this, and mm -hmm. then she, and she mm -hmm. goes back. All right. There we go. <laughs> I don't know if I trust there you. There we go. <laughs> there we go. So I have crescent rolls that I am just separating, and I'm going to um, put them in a circle and seal the like seams a pizza. together. Like a pizza. Yep. And then we have whipped cream, and we have blueberries, and we have strawberries, we have raspberries, and kiwi. And, and uh, we're gonna make delicious. You can certainly get very creative on your own with this. Oh yeah, When you for start sure. decorating it. These were just our choices for the fruit topping, but you can. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I forgot to spray the pan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first. We're never gonna get a show on the Food we're Network a if you we keep that up. We are a mess. Yeah. Over the sink, safety issues. Well, um, <laughs> I think our, our viewers would be glad to know that you are no longer doing roofing. I am no longer this doing roofing. This all goes in roofing. here, right? Just, nope, no, nope, just that. Nope, Do okay. that right there. Please. All right. Uh, she has been on the roof. We replaced. How long? Four you and your months. Husband. It took forever. 
It took forever, four months. And she said she did a lot of crying. I wanted to cry a lot, yes. But we replaced a flat roof. We saved $4,000. So that's what I keep telling myself. That's why it's okay. And you said that when it really got bad, you just got quiet. You didn't, we, we didn't, you didn't snap fight. at each other. We, no, we just got really got quiet, quiet and, and cried. did our work. Yeah. yeah. Okay, now what goes after this? Okay, so you're not you're not going to blend this in. Okay. You're going to fold it. Hold it. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Get some of that off of there. That's the deliciousness mm -hmm. that just makes. The yeah, and that was 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 that <laughs> a strawberry jam or raspberry? That was strawberry jam. Yeah. Yeah. So you just put these out and then you spread them out and you seal the seams together and you're gonna just make like a round pizza. And then once you do that, you're gonna bake this so that you have a crust that's already mm -hmm. made because then it doesn't go back in the oven when you're... Now we did one gentle. also... Gentle, hey, be gentle. You're oh, folding, fold you're not it. cremating yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't uh, take your frustrations out on my current whipping cream, please. I know it. We did, uh, we did one with a brownie yes, crust, which is yes. wonderful. Actually, that was last 4th of July. That was our 4th the, of July one. Because uh, we had red, you know white, and fun? blue. You know what's fun? There's a lot of patriotic recipes out there. Yes. I started fixing things when my daughter's boys were real little. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would they would help me. They'd laugh at that now. but Yeah. Okay, so, so. you get the gist of this. You're yeah. making it round. And you're then you're sealing the seams and then you're baking it. Yeah. And then and here's one. When you bake it, this is what you get. And I'll finish. Yeah, the you're going to finish cutting. I I am putting you to work today, sister. I know it. I usually just stand and look gorgeous. So this was whipping cream that you mixed. You had cream cheese, mm -hmm. you had confectionery sugar, and you had mm -hmm. 2 tablespoons of strawberry jam that you mixed mm -hmm. together. Then you folded in an 8 ounce container of cool whip, mm -hmm. whipping cream. Do you know what one viewer said? What? She tries to write down the recipe and we talk over each other. Yeah, so stop it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes, so that and was And we that. guarantee that will change. <laughs> we'll try. We'll try yeah. to be good. We'll try. Now, the, you don't need all of this. No, it's Because it's it makes a huge, a huge pile, but you can use this as a dipping cream for fruit or for, yeah. or just eat it with a spoon. That would be okay too. So you do the kiwi in half kind of, right? Y yes, and then in half again. Like that? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. But you can do it however. It's just about decorating. Yeah, this is um, totally up to you. You can be as creative as you want. Yes. And there's probably other <clears throat> kinds of fruit you might like. You could put anything on a peach. Sure, you could put anything you want. This is your gig when you're doing it. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Um, well, I would probably do this. Yeah. I like all kinds the of berries. Are good. I, I think uh, peaches would be pretty. Yes, and very tasty. I mm -hmm. might even put a little lemon zest in this. Yeah, that would be good. Okay, and then this is my therapy right here. This is therapy for me. I you just sit and you just decorate it and make it very pretty. You could uh, put somebody's name on there. Yeah, you know, make it. So you can get the pretty one. Mm -hmm. That's all done. Here is a finished one. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Oh uh -huh. my gosh, this stuff is so tasty. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That one was too small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any of them that don't fit right, she eats them. I eat them. <laughs> hey, it's fruit. Yeah, good for you. And you can load it up. Yep. So here we go. Mm. You can't, it can't not be good. Oh my. You have crescent rolls, you have cream cheese. It's wonderful. You'll have to use my fork. Okay. But you don't have cooties, right? No, no, no. Do you? No. No, okay. That's just got a blueberry on there. <laughs> what do you mm. think? Hey, this is a fun one and your kids will love it. I was saying, get it. your kids in the kitchen, let them decorate it. Yeah. And, uh, oh my gosh, that's good. It's, it's easy because the fruit really sticks good to that. Yes. If you want it, we'll be glad to send it to you. If you don't have a computer, just write to us. The address will come up on your screen. It's free. Uh, but otherwise, email, and we'll send it right back to you. And I think this is one you're going to enjoy. Have a lot of fun with it. Now, stay. I want you to meet my new best friend, John Cortinis. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, just write to the address on your screen. 
or you can email your request to artheline at rippy.org. Well, I'm glad to introduce to you uh, one of the authors of the book, God and Money, and his name is John Cortinas, and he is a lot younger than I expected when I read the book. <laughs> now, so you are a millennial. That's right. And what, what is that? What's the age? That's a good question. I'm 27, and I know I'm not the oldest millennial around, so... Um, People in their 20s and early 30s, I think, is about what, what the millennials represent these days. I know you, you hear a lot about them. Uh, they're quite a block in our society. Um, uh, I would say wielding a lot of influence, um, maybe in the elections and so forth. Uh, we hear a lot about what they're looking for. And this is what was so surprising with your book, because as, as we talk, you'll know that the whole premise is very scriptural and it's about generosity and you and uh, Gregory your co-author went to Harvard Business School we did we started there in the fall of 2013 we showed up and and like you said essentially had plans to learn how to get rich that's <laughs> it's a good place to learn that and that was what I was very excited about in my life we hear a lot about Harvard uh, how difficult is it to get in it's, it's fairly, I mean, as you would imagine, it's selective. And I think by God's grace, I, I got in. I'm from Texas and I don't have, you know, Ivy League connections or anything like that. And so I was surprised and thrilled when I got in myself. And uh, it's, I think it's something like 10% that they admit of those mm -hmm. who apply. Well, I know it carries an awful lot of clout all through your life, uh, really. You can trust me on that. Um, so you and your friend, you were Christians. We were. Right, but you were going to go find out how to attain the, maybe the American dream earlier and then stack it up. You know, they say get all you can and then sit on the can. And um, At what point, as a believer, did you make radical changes on what you planned to do with your own money? Well, so you're right. We, we came into school, into business school, planning um, to amass a fortune, and we each had a little bit of a different way of looking at that. For me... It was not always, it's not about lifestyle for me. It's actually about savings and it's about security. It's about sitting on the can, just like you mm -hmm. said. And so I can actually, I have a legacy of this. Even in high school, I saved up $10,000 from, from mowing lawns. I mowed hundreds of lawns <laughs> in high school. Gosh. And then in, I finished college, actually. I was blessed with scholarships. I worked really hard over my summers. I socked it all away. And I had $100,000 when I came out of college. And so oh, my I, word. And so I Never was. Never heard such a thing. <laughs> well, it was. It was. So um, you didn't have any any school debt. I didn't, and that was that was a great blessing. And but what's so interesting is that that's celebrated, right? Oh wow, great job accumulating. I was a tither. I gave my ten percent, and then I saved as much as I could after that. But what was hidden inside of me was this feeling that the more money I get, the more secure I am, and I'm actually worth something because of the amount of money I have. And I think that's what began to be revealed to me when. Greg and I took this class called God and Money at Harvard Divinity School. And we looked all through the scriptures and we studied the lives of radically generous Christians and began to find ourselves challenged. Like we, we had this wrong maybe and we needed to learn some things. And it changed your, your whole life and behavior when it came it, to money. It absolutely did. And so, you know, one of the things we did, we, we set out to write a term paper, this book, had humble beginnings as a term paper. And we, um, we went out to interview tons of generous people, like I said, and we encountered people like a family that told us, you know, we have a decent home, we're raising our kids in it, but we wanna upgrade to a nicer house. And then the Holy Spirit challenged us to take this $100,000 we've saved up and then just give it to our church and stay where we are now. That's and, huge. And Greg, That's huge. <laughs> we, we're looking at each other on the phone with these people like, they're crazy, what's, what's going on? But the more we studied scripture, we found that that's where the heart of God, God's heart is, is a giving heart. For God so loved, he gave. It's the most famous verse. And the more that our lives can reflect his character in that, the more joy and peace and freedom we can obtain in our lives. And so we did begin to make some choices to reorient our own plans for the future. 
Yeah, because the American mindset is to keep moving up in the house, you know, or the better car and all. And so I, when I first picked up the book, I thought, well, you guys you got it all, and now you can tell us how to be generous. But you've actually made the decision to not buy a brand new car and uh, to really not have any debt at all, which is the American way. It's the, it's the credit card, the mortgage, the... We had a, um, actually, it was so interesting how this happened. So in terms of not upgrading our lifestyles, uh, Greg and I and our wives, Megan and Allison, we each made a decision to draw what we call a finish line on our lifestyle. We basically said, we will live, and this is not, you know, a poverty gospel. We said, we'll live a middle to upper middle class life, a nice life to raise our family, but we won't go beyond that. If I make a million dollars a year some year, that's fine. That's just more giving, but it's not going to be more lifestyle. And in setting that finish line, I actually received a month before graduation the opportunity to join a ministry called Generous Giving that exists to spread the message of generosity. And clearly, they can't pay what I was going to be making as a Harvard Business School graduate. They're a Christian ministry. But what was so neat about God's call on Megan and my life to do this is that because we had said we will live a reasonable lifestyle, we were actually free in our heart to go join a ministry, which we never yeah. would have considered otherwise. Boy, that's refreshing. You must have married the right woman. She's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the second miracle is that you both had wives that will agree to this. And, and, and to make it really plain, you have made the decision that this is kind of our lifestyle. And, and this is where we're going to stay. And as we get more and more, we're going to give it away. Um, the only other person I've ever read that comes close to that is Randy Alcorn. And, and he, he did write your um, forward on this. Because being a Christian television, all, all you get is these prosperity books and how God wants to give you a hundredfold so you can have the uh, Cadillac and the whatever goes with it. And this, what you have put in here, it's almost like a brand new revelation. I'm sure it is to a lot of people. But you, you talk about making specific goals and a finish line. Can you um, give us a definition of, of, of your idea of a finish line? Sure. And, and just one comment on, on Randy is such a role model to Greg uh -huh. and I. And, and you, you talk about the, you know, this prosperity idea, but Second Corinthians, Paul says, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. I think that's mm -hmm. what has been brought to light for, for us. Mm -hmm. But this finish line idea, you know, we were looking at graduating from a wonderful program at Harvard Business School and f making a lot of money. And so we wanted to draw a line. This is not a requirement of scripture. We would never say that. We just think this is a good idea. It's, mm -hmm. it's a good idea, so we'll try it. And we just said, um, to put the number out there, it's 100,000 a year. We said, we won't live beyond that. That's a nice life. That's, that's a, a nice great life. life. Yeah. And that's nicer than many people ever get to live. But we will not go beyond that. And um, so we've made that choice and now and forever. And that's how we'll raise our families. And so Greg actually, his company got bought out. He got a, a very large multiples of $100,000, a very large windfall in his first year of work. And so to see the freedom that he and Allison had to say, you know what, this is an amazing blessing from God. Mm -hmm but we're just gonna be generous. We may pay off some debt, we're gonna be very generous, but our lifestyle's not going to increase. Boy, that is, uh, it's, it's like a brand new idea. I can identify uh, with a lot. I, I love Dave Ramsey, and I think he is a, a huge blessing. I, I refuse to pay any interest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I've often thought about, you know, you hear this, $300 million Powerball or something like that. I can't win because I don't buy a ticket, but um, I thought if I had that, my car is fine. My house is fine. Um, I wouldn't change that much. I might get more facials and a massage once in a while. That's what I would do. Massages are nice. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, that's, um, is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, how do you determine how much you allow, you know, uh, how much do you keep? I think that's the first thing. How much do I keep? I've, I've got obligation. I've got a family. And I'm sure you want to put your children through college and all those things. That's right. Absolutely. So we walk through a lot of the specifics in the book. But I would just say that, um, you know, there's, there's a, a balance in Scripture. There's a very clear warning against the dangers of wealth. And that's countercultural to our mm -hmm. American ideal of, of mm -hmm. wealth is great, accumulate wealth, build wealth. And I, that's 
can be provision for our family in terms of a college fund for our kids or a secure retirement. But I think we have to be very careful and watch our heart and make sure there's not an idol that's forming that says my money can take care of me, when the truth is it's only God that can take care of me. And so in terms of setting that lifestyle, I think that's a decision every believer has to make on their own because if God wanted there to be a number, he probably would have given it to us, and he, and he didn't. And, and you do have actual examples in this book, and I, I think you bear your own soul. We do. We share uh, every dollar we have is in that book. And <laughs> yeah, if you want to know anything about his finances, you can get the book. And if you just tuned in, I'm talking about God and Money, one of the most refreshing books I've read in a long time. And I always like to um, tell uh, my pastor friends out there and those who are in some kind of a teaching capacity, I bring authors on here, they've done all the work. I mean, they've done all the, the heavy lifting to write books on a certain subject, and you need these in your library. I can definitely aid you when, when God gives you a subject that he wants you to preach or teach on. There's a lot of good things in here, and the website is on the screen. I certainly encourage you to go there. Uh, what is your belief about tithing? I know there are a lot of people say, well, it's Old Testament, and I think the New Testament requires more, but uh, or certainly suggests it. Absolutely. You know, I think when we started, we really wanted to understand this topic because this is how I viewed my giving before business school was I'll, I'll tithe. I'll give my 10% and then God must be happy with me and then I can <laughs> do what I want with the rest. And I think what became so clear to us as we looked through Genesis to Revelation, what does it say about money? Over 2,000 verses on money, by the way. Uh -huh. it's, it's all through Scripture. Jesus talked a lot about it. He did. And it's, it's clear that God's interested in 100% of what he gives me and, and looking at what I do with that. Now, the specifics of giving, I, I think I agree with you. Going beyond 10% is, is fantastic. And if you look at the Old Testament tithe, there were three tithes, actually. The Levitical tithe, the charity tithe once every three years to the support the poor, and the festival tithe, which was to throw a big party and celebrate what God has done. And so I, th I find it curious when we're told we have to do one of the three, but not the other two. And so I, I don't fall on a legalistic stance, but I do think with how blessed we are in this country that getting beyond 10% is a good idea. My wife and I, even working for a Christian ministry, do give more than 10%. And if they want the Old Testament, that's over 20%, isn't it? If, if you oh, that's took right. In those... All three of those together. Yeah, and... all you that love the Old Testament. Um... And then don't lend at interest to your brother in need and be a kinsman redeemer and let the poor glean from your land. I mean, there's all these things. Mm -hmm. So your whole life is a generous life on what we see in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, as someone, I've uh, been in the ministry all my life and I'll get these statistics and what the Christians give in America is pathetic. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe just from what I've read, you know, just quickly, that if every Christian paid 10%, you never have to take up an extra offering for missions or anything else, that uh, the American Christian overall is not giving a tithe. I think that's true. The research we did would, would bear that out. And, and I think, you know, the average number for giving in America is about 2%. Oh, that's terrible. And when we, if you look at church going Christians, you get something closer to five to 8%, which is better, much better than the average of our society, but still. But it know, doesn't even reach the more. 10. But I think what's so, what's important is that this is a, an opportunity actually, rather than a we should give more. It's, it's not so much a sense of guilt, I think, but rather an opportunity to say, God has given us unlimited grace, and how can we pour that out? And when we do that, when we become more generous, we actually receive from Him, not necessarily money, not necessarily money raining down from the sky, but the joy and the peace and the fellowship with Him as we walk hand in hand. And if people followed this idea, there would be a whole lot less stress and anxiety. I... Uh, I'm a whole lot closer to retirement than you are. And uh, every once in a while that thing, is there enough, you know? And the Lord's really spoke to me one day. I'm very careful when I say that. Be very careful when you say God told me. Uh, but he really spoke to me. He said, do you have enough for today? And that's the way he works. He works in daily bread. Uh, his mercies are new every morning. We live on this 24 hour cycle. And he's got all the ability in the world to bring together what we need in the future. I, that doesn't excuse us for not doing our very best, uh, but just the same. It's not anything that we're supposed to be real anxious over. That's so true. Absolutely. You know, I think 
Yeah, retirement is such a difficult topic and so many mm -hmm. people are, are getting later in life and realizing I may not have enough. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, one thing is God has so much compassion on all of our circumstances, financial and otherwise. Mm -hmm. And But even in the midst of that uncertainty, to try and plan responsibly, just like you said, but then to say, I'm going to take a step of faith into mm -hmm. generosity and just pray, God, would you meet me in this? Yeah, and I had that happen recently. I had prayed and prayed and prayed about something, a need for a ministry. And um, one day the Lord spoke to me, said, well, you prayed a lot, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And he <laughs> impressed me to write the biggest check, you know, for my bank account. But I have learned enough. Write it and don't look back. Mm, absolutely. And I told the person that was going, to, I said, I'm not worried about it. He'll give it back to me. That's the way he works. I, if we have time for this, um, you bring up the difference. Uh, uh, we got two minutes. Uh, some people's view of sin. Now, we're very... Um, in, the, in the United States, sexual sin is horrible. It is, it is. But you say, I think it's in Liberia that they think greed is about the worst sin you can commit. So I guess we pick and choose our sins because we don't think much that we're sinful when we're greedy. That's right. We, have, we so often have cultural blinders. And, and there's, I heard a great businessman who gives over 90 something percent of his income away. He said, if I went into my church bragging about adultery, I'd be condemned and people would uh -huh. correct me in brotherly love. If I started living according to my income and I bought a multi-million dollar mansion and I had sports cars, uh -huh. people in my church would probably congratulate me, uh -huh. but I would be sinning against God nonetheless. And so that, Man, that's those, powerful. those blinders are so real. And you know, I'll be the first to say, I'm John and I struggle with greed. Uh -huh. And, and scripture is so clear on greed. It's something we all have in our heart and we all can go to the Lord and say, please help me God to overcome this. Uh, it's kind of my belief that in the community, the Christians ought to be the smartest with their money and with their health. We should be the healthiest and handle our money the best. So what a, what a beautiful uh, picture of a disciple, that disciplined follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you come back sometime? Would love to, I anytime. would. I would love to. We're, we are out of time. Uh, we have had his website up for quite a while. I really encourage you to get this book. As you know, I read lots of books and usually enjoy every single one of them. This one is a real standout and it will be a blessing to you. So I hope that you will do that. And John said he'd come back and uh, he will be more than welcome. But until then, please remember, there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers.